look at some of the work um, that's been produced lately by uh, <coughs> and Beth and Laura Wood, uh, who I'm really delighted to like, like welcome here today. And, um, and I think perhaps just for now, I just want to ask a few quick questions um, before we maybe do the presentations. But I just wanted to talk a little bit um, just about um, you know, where you've come from and what your uh, background is. Um, and, and starting with you, Anna, I wanted to just uh, talk a little bit, a bit about your past, as it were, because I, 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 I was born in London, so were you. And I was just saying earlier, it's kind of like we're a bit of a rare breed these days. Yeah. But you're, you're from Deptford. Yeah, from sunny south London. And, and it's always been an amazing, I mean, Deptford is just such a, for anyone who's spent any length of time there, the Deptford Creek and, and Deptford itself, it's quite an extraordinary part of the world. Yeah, I think, I'm, I'm so used to it, obviously, having grown up there. It's actually yeah. played a big part in a lot of stuff that I do, sort of Deptford Market and Deptford High Street, it's come back to haunt me. Um, yeah, I love it down there, I'd happily yeah. be there the whole time. Yeah. My boyfriend, on the other hand, is a staunch West Londoner, is not up for it. <laughs> Thinks it's like going on holiday down there. <laughs> and, and Beth, you're from the Midlands, mm -hmm. and um, you were telling me earlier, with much sadness, of course, that there was at the town from which you came, there was a bypass, there was a new motorway system, but it kind of went round. Well, it was, it's, yeah. it's the joke that a lot of like, towns in Middle England kind of are, got changed a lot because of bypasses and new roads and stuff in the 60s and 70s, but we weren't really a very poor or a very uh, specialist town, so we kind of got left alone. So we've still got a lot of our kind of uh, really old medieval buildings and Tudor buildings and things like that. So we've got only the train station and the market hall kind of got 60-ified. So it's got kind of black and white versions of 1960s style of Tudor buildings, which I really <laughs> love. And everybody who lives in Tudor thinks is ghastly and horrible because it used to be like Victoriana metalwork. Uh, but I quite like the trendy <laughs> 60s version of the Tudor. And, and, and did it have, has it had an impact on you? I mean, I'm trying to be for you in some kind of, mm. uh, and as, in terms of your past, but is it, is it a place that, I mean, I, I, I just took from what Anna was saying there about the markets and this idea of the, the, the sort of trinkets and all the bits and bobs you can buy in these markets, which we'll, we'll come back to later, perhaps, in, in a way, but would, would it have any, any telling um, impact on what you do now? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, even when I lived uh, in in Shrewsbury, I always we always did car boot sales and that kind of uh, Middle England kind of land of stuff in fields and uh, and charity shops and and there used to be a really big antique kind of flea market thing in Shrewsbury. So I used to always go to to those when I when I lived in Shrewsbury. So I definitely yeah picked up a lot of trinkets when I when I lived at home and then carried on picking up more. <coughs> Great. Um, Anna, do you want to just maybe kick yeah. off with your presentation? I mean, there's a great image at the front there, which I remember seeing and just thinking, wow, who, who made this? Yeah, and then we would be not long after that, but yeah. please fire away. And, and so I'm going to rattle through quite a few projects, um, some faster than others. This is um, a project for Wonderland Magazine Editorial. I do, I'm a set designer, so I do quite a lot of different things from big installations down to still life editorial fashion and yeah, like a big variation. Um, yeah, this is quite a nice project and we talk about collaborating with people and that's a real strong part of my practice. Um, so obviously I make things but I'm always working for with a photographer or makeup artist or stylist or you know within space certain set of parameters and I think that's really important to me. I really enjoy having sort of different people interject. Is a project that um, I had, we've had sitting around for about a year that we wanted to do, but we're just waiting for the right person to come along to persuade them to let us actually do it and have a platform for it to go out on. Um, and we got approached with a makeup brand called Girlian, which is quite a traditional French makeup brand, and an issue of Wonderland called Outspoken, and they just let us roll with it because when there's no money, you tend to get to persuade them to do exactly what you want. Um, this, the model was really not happy about the whole thing on the day, obviously, because she had to put her face through quite an uncomfortable hole. It's a bit like <laughs> the Brighton, end of the Brighton Pier kind of aspect, which is 
part of my collection. I've got loads of collections written on the back of it. Um, yeah, so it was a great shoot. She had it was her and then other hand models all around her and stuff. She was really not happy about it all the day. But <laughs> you've got to suffer. Um, all right, I'm gonna go into Chrome. Cause so I have to do it on my website because it won't do that normally. Um, I did a really big project for Clark's Originals, um, which came out in August, but I actually did it about a year ago. Um, and they <coughs> invited me to do a project with them, and they just sort of said how much it's going to, how much they're going to cost, and what do you want to do. Um, so I told them that I wanted to go and do a residency in their HQ in Somerset and Street because they've got all the traditional kind of methods of making shoes. I spent two weeks with the designers and all the different departments from like the 3D printing area to the um, old shoemaker and who prototypes everything and then the last makers. And the project was all about being a master of your craft and how if you do something every day then you become a master of your craft. So this is some of it. It was a really big project. Yeah, it was just all about textures and like conversations that we had while the two weeks was going on. Um, a lot to do with mistakes because that's something that I really celebrate and also something that all of the kind of older guys that have been working there are like, you can't be afraid of making mistakes the whole time because that's where you learn. They're a great brand to work with because they literally just gave me complete freedom which is very, very rare. <laughs> When you, when you talk there about complete freedom to do as you as you wish, I mean, do you see these objects and these these sort of little installations somewhere as things that you this is what you want to do anyway, um, and you would do on any given day? Yes. Or? Well, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's inspired by the time there, so I guess it was kind of a starting point. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess as much freedom as somebody still paying your bills. Um, yeah, I do a lot of my own work, so it always comes back through, and anyone that this is as much as it's going to be me with somebody else, yeah. you know, as I said, with the collaboration thing. But it's also, it's also that thing about the client in this case, I mean, just simply understanding, perhaps, and yeah. letting you produce things that don't, for instance, directly put a, put a product at the fore or do yeah, something Yeah, well, they said like it, didn't, it was like completely unbranded, which is yeah. virtually unheard of. Yeah. I think they've never worked with a designer before, they normally work with musicians, so I just don't really think they knew what to expect, <laughs> which is maybe a, you saw a, loophole. a blessing. Yeah. So, um, right, so this is like a tiny corner of my studio, my shelves, a bit excited. Um, I've got loads of crap, basically. <laughs> I've actually had to move studio because my studio mates have sort of evicted me from my last place because they were swamped by my belongings. Um, <laughs> Can you talk a bit about what's, just really briefly, what's yeah. in that picture? What's that dog? Uh, I just really like him. He's got human eyes rather than um, dog eyes. He's got like the whites in his eyes. He's, I just, he's just a great guy. Um, yeah, that sponge. I've got a really big collection of sponges. I'm really into them. And that one's got like a hand through it. Kind of weird from the pound shop. So your studio was just filling up. These, these are pound shop items. A lot of pound shop yeah. stuff. A lot of, yeah, depth market kind of finds a lot of eBay I've got weird searches going on on eBay. Um, this is like a tiny corner of like the pound shop collection that I've been sort of collecting for about 10 years. And it's a lot of sort of useless things, functionless stuff, that I'm, and it's texture and colour and... Is it, is it to kill some uh, slate your, your consumerist thirst? Or, <laughs> you know, that you've at least gone out and bought something on a, on a, on a, on a certain day, or is it... Is it this colour that interests I think it's you? the colour and the kind of absurdity and yeah. just things from gone, gone by times, like those scratch cards from a place in um, near Arsenal Stadium, and they've got this like massive, it's a wholesaler's, and you pull out boxes, and there's like scratch cards from 1982, and you could win like a really crap car, and that kind of game show kind of quality. Do you There's think you'll ever be on a TV show where you're sort of nursed by psychiatrists to remove some of these things to create more space in your life. I think I probably should um, Yeah, I did a really big, it actually paid off because I did a really big project with Vauxhall Cars and they um, went on a road trip around the UK going to weird festivals and went to like a scarecrow festival collecting souvenirs and then made the car into a giant souvenir. So people have got used to the idea that I've got odd collections. Yeah, there's a bit of a sponge collection. 
Um, so all of these things, and then I, I, all the things that I collected, and I did a series of works sort of based around that for Pick Me Up at Somerset House last year. I had to make all new work for it. Um, and it just became like a celebrated kind of collective culture that I've got. And this is one of the shots from it, the Louis Vuitton watermelon. I've got a lot of fakes. I love fakes, but the, bad, the worse the better. Kind of thing. Um, and yeah, this is a series of work pool party. I guess a lot of my work sort of has like a little nod to a bit of nostalgia or a certain place or a certain time and things taken out of context. Can you, can you just give us, while we're here, a, a better sense of what you mean by set design? Because some yeah, people that might weird. mean one thing. I mean, how do you interpret it? Um, well, I don't do sets for kind of theatre, which is obviously yeah. probably the immediate yeah. reaction that people have. Um, I guess it's just the easiest way of explaining it because I like working on a commercial platform. I like working with brands. Um, I enjoy the deadlines. I like the, the starting points. I like taking what they do and sort of translating it in my own language. I don't, know, I don't know if it's artist or set designer or what, but you have to call it something. <laughs> um, and there's kind of there is a history of the kind of set design side of it in the commercial sense, and it does it maybe it belongs best in there. So you've got to have a name, otherwise people can't find you for what you might do. <laughs> I don't know. So yeah, set design works for me. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is part of the pool party series. I mean, I, I, every, I thought this one in particular for me was very interesting because it, it has, for want of better words, your sort of aesthetic. Everything is very clear. Everything is in a almost graph, near graphic state. Yeah. Even though it's an object, it's it's there's something going to be pure about it. Um, there's a great sense of plas you know, modern plastics, and uh, and in ways it kind of almost uh, touches on artists, Jeff yeah. Koons or. Um, in, 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 in this way in which you, you kind of openly use Louis Vuitton and so on. But what's clear, to me at least, is that it's a very constant, consistent yeah. style yeah. you have. And I'm, I'm interested that like commercially people come to you probably wanting this style. I mean, it's like you don't necessarily budge. It's no, they're, yeah, they're coming, that's just got to a good place where people are coming to me for what I do. Yeah, I guess it's it's always a sense of like a place that you can't quite get to, like a sense of luxury. And I, that I get really get off on having a proper high-end thing or brand and then putting it with like a fake Louis Vuitton town. People just definitely shouldn't buy into it, but they do. Um, and then this yeah. is what led through to the Selfridges window that I did recently, the Bright Young Things thing, um, which again is just yeah, things that I love. It's was kind of selling yourself on in a window, so it's into, I think yeah. that it's pretty weird that you don't have, I don't have a product, I don't make a a bracelet or it's, you know, or something like that, I make a, a scenario, like a scene, so, um, yeah, it's us, a bit weird putting... Talk us through, I mean, how do, it's, it's not an, this is not an easy space to fill, or no, curate, no, or, no, quite no. Hard. How, how do you... How do you come to it? Do you make a model at home? I, you... do you know what? My mum told me to make a model and I laughed in her face. I was like, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and then three weeks before I did it, I made a model and it was the best thing I ever did. Um, yeah, I just sort of start, I start sketching and I've got, like, as I said, a bank of sort of ideas and things that I like, textures, materials, and then they'll just sort of come together and I tend to set things up in my studio and play with them for a period of time before it goes to installing. I like things that move and things that light up, so there was always that idea. And I had quite a few things that Selfridges said, absolutely no way you're not doing yeah. that. So this yeah. is what we compromised on. Yeah. Involved a paint walker. <laughs> um, and then this is the last project that I've just done, um, a project for Converse. Um, and it was an installation, they did like four artists, did an installation in various pubs across London, and it was about you know, up winter, get outside and enjoy yourself wherever it's cold or not. Um, and it was a weather based installation, so it actually, um, the sequencing is all to do with the last 30 years of the history of the weather in Bethnal Green. It's actually quite boring. But um, me and my assistant, my poor assistant, went through every day um, of weather for the last 30 years in Bethnal Green and then coded it all into the weather symbols. But some, it's a bit cheating because some of them really didn't happen, like the that one means like the sky is totally obscured by smoke, but I just really like the symbol, so it went in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I've got a little film on them. The how it sequences. Right. 
they were, Converse were saying that Converse are completely obsessed, this is really sped up. Yeah. Um, Converse were completely obsessed with the hashtag, obviously. And then as I installed it, I smashed those, like it says, get winterized at the bottom. And I smashed the hashtag as I was putting it in. <laughs> and all hell broke loose. They didn't give a shit about the rest of it. Oh they just God. were like on the hashtag. It should have just been a big hashtag, get winterized, <laughs> just the hashtag. It was quite funny. I mean, you, you, you're sort of touching on, on this, and there's questions that I will ask really both of you later, but, you know, how much of it is born out of compromise? Have there, have there been moments when you've had, you just thought, I have, I'm going to walk out on this, or I can't work with this party? I've never walked out on a job, but I have been taken off to. <laughs> <laughs> so the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll always go, I'll, you know, I'll stick it until the end, but... You've got to learn what battles to fight, and yeah. if your name's attached to it, then it's got to be, you've got to fight it, and if it's not, then I'll do whatever you want, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if it's, if money's good enough. Or... It's very, it's very, it's, it's a very beautiful piece of the city moving now. Um, I just, uh, just a small detail, in many of the images, there's clearly an obsession with nails, and red nails in particular, <laughs> I've noticed, nails. are often yeah. in the work. I mean, what, what, what are your, what's inspiring you, what's in the background? I think it probably does come down to where I grew up and all the things that you just do as you're growing up that you don't really think anything of, like getting my nails done in the nail shops in Lewisham. Like the nail shop down in Deptford's got the best posters you've ever seen in your life in there. Like girls with guns and big long 90s talents and stuff. And yeah, you know, I've got like quite a big collection of things to do with um, KFC, which I love. And a lot of that I've got some of the old artwork that used to go into the KFC, which is the most weird, like totally unbranded, and it's just got these giant chicken. They're like totally inflated, but almost the size of these small children that are holding them, looking like they're having the best time of their life. Um, yeah, I like tacky stuff. <laughs> That's that's it. That sounds good. Yeah. Um, Beth, we're going to go over to you, I hope, and your presentation in, mm -hmm. in due course. Um, I mean, actually, one of the things, can I just hold that up, is that we, we yes, have this conversation on the day this book uh, has been released, um, which is 10 years in the bag. You see there's the fourth plinth with a Selfridges bag on top, mm -hmm. and it's a book of all the window displays in recent years in which uh, artists and creative individuals have been um, actively uh, involved in putting them together. And it's quite a fascinating publication. I'm not here to promote this, but I'm just saying it's interesting how it comes at a time uh, where one might say that this is certainly as a book almost comes across as a, a, a very much as an art catalog. It's very much contextualized in the sense in, in, in the language of contemporary art. Um, but before we go to Beth and, and her display, um, so it's really it's really somebody who, who uses a Mac in front yeah. of a PC and you're like, it's like oh, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, have we actually hidden it? Yeah, yeah, it's just the PC thing. That's no, I need the, the other right. one with more stuff in it. <laughs> 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 I'm not waffled on. Becky, just before we start with you, I, I look at your website and it, mm. it's sort of insane, I think, because of how much you do, how active you are, and how much energy and creative energy you have. I mean, I, and, and given that you're, you're still very young, uh, when, I, when I think about the list, of the, that you have, of what you do. So you're working in furniture, lighting, accessories, tableware, miscellaneous. Yeah. Uh, uh, but also pattern design, you're working on exhibitions, you also can list residencies and commissions, teaching and workshops, as well as installations. Yeah. So busy, busy young lady. I'm not picky, I like doing yeah. stuff. <laughs> Uh, no, I think, I mean, a lot of things feed one into, a, yeah. into the other with, with my work, but I've always um, liked doing stuff, making stuff, yeah. and I, I kind of, as long as I can, I like to not have to be limited to only doing one type of stuff, if I can do lots yeah. of them. But I'll do, I'll do a wave where I did, like, when I graduated from my BA, I did more jewellery then, because I moved to East London, and it was something I could produce 
small in my house, even though my housemates didn't like it a huge amount because I made the dining room into a you know, sweatshop of myself. Um, but so it depends for some types of projects or some situations, it's easier or it, it's better to do certain types of things. So for jewellery, I did a lot at that point and I do less now because I've been, uh, had more connections to do furniture and sometimes I'll do, um, when I do things like residencies or I'm invited to work uh, with particular things, I kind of don't really want to go in saying, I will do this. I'd rather spend some time kind of looking at what's available and then it will find the direction it wants to be. So like when I did a residency in, in Venice, I, I did both a light um, a pattern and uh, another pattern, which I'll, I'll show you there at the end of the presentation and I'll explain them a bit more, but it kind of, it, it, it was, I like to kind of research and then find the right direction for something rather than force it to be something just because I am a furniture designer, so it must be furniture. But um, yeah, it just kind of depends on what projects come up. Um, and uh, for my presentation, I've got just not a huge amount of images, just a small selection, but this is just uh, one of the main ones I show because that's kind of, for the m m most of my work since graduating from the RCA has had a strong leaning to this, which was my kind of collecting of pattern that I was finding in public spaces and I got really obsessed by yeah, the things that I saw as pattern, be it if they were directly tiles on a wall or if they were just confetti on a floor, which I photographed a lot when I was in Venice and people thought I was really a little bit <laughs> crazy. <laughs> yeah, because so like it's confetti, it looks the same, I'm like, no it doesn't. Mm. <laughs> this confetti was bought somewhere else from this one because it's got this colour and, and then yeah, you're a little bit then you have to stop taking the pictures because it's a bit obsessive. But um, one of the main other obsessions I've had or, that I, I love uh, now and probably will for a long time is, is laminate, which is this material that um, is a lot in the city and a lot in all types of places. And it changes depending on, you know, uh, this is a laundrette where it's a crazy, amazing kind of marble. And then I got obsessed one day when I realised that in the bi banks, when they were refurbing, I think it was the Halifax, they were like doing a laminate that had an edging that was representing ply and the connotations of why, you know, because ply kind of came in fashion, but it's not, it's that all these weird connotations that different materials and signals that they have, but then using it as a laminate instead of using real ply. And I just got really obsessed by how this one material could be so many different things. Um, so quite a lot of my furniture work works with uh, laminate. Um, so this is the first uh, kind of investigation I did with, with laminate uh, based on, on rocks. And the, it was a much wider project about creating distance through detail, which is why I used rocks as a, as a pattern and also because laminate tended, tended, or a large proportion of it, tends to be, uh, tending to be a more luxury material. And so I kind of wanted to play with this kind of super fakeness. Um, so I've done work like that. And these are close-ups, so you can see that um, every different bit of laminate starts to make a conversation with its neighbour. And you can go from one laminate that's uh, part of the collection design from Memphis, and next door to it you've got the laminate, which is currently the, you know, the KFC laminate. Mm -hmm. um, and I like very much the connection that y you get with people and the work, or even yesterday I was having a meeting with somebody and she was looking at my bracelets and then suddenly she kind of got some nostalgic memory of childhood and one of these reminding her of a place, a cafe or something from, from her her home and, and so I really like that with the working with the laminates I can make different conversations with different people depending on you know the, the associations they have with them. Um, and this is kind of what my bedroom look like when I was doing, uh, doing another laminate project. So after doing rocks, I moved on to wood. And, um, and it was kind of, uh, I, I was doing a project for the design museum and I, w I was asked to design something in relation to the building. Um, and then when I went to Abbott Laminati, who are a lovely laminate company that I've, I've worked with, and they, they just kind of 
they now they just leave me in the storeroom because I they, um, they know I'm going to be hours there and they just come and get me or remove me when they want to leave and they just gave me all this uh, dead stock um, of all these wood grains that they uh, produced um, so I made um, this pattern which was based on OSB boards so I kind of like to mix up both like textures but also um, with patterns I, I often reference um, things that aren't necessarily seen as, as pattern but for me I see the pattern in them so I got really obsessed by particle board and this kind of flat explosion that um, it, it has when you kind of stare at them long enough which I did stare at quite a few boards um, and so that's the that's the furniture piece the first uh, edition and I've now done another uh, piece after this um, working with the same pattern but um, kind of working more finely I think with the carpentry and the cabinet making um, and then I've also done things like uh, this this which was more um, m less with such contrasting um, uh, colors but I was really interested in, in kind of creating an overall color themes that work together and um, yeah these kind of tables interlocked every time I do something with the laminate I'm trying to like find out something new about it be it like a different way of working with the colors or get, giving a different feeling across um, and then uh, what else so this is a uh, one of my most recent pieces, so this is kind of moving away from the from the laminate. There is still some laminate there, but I, I restrained the marquetry down. But this was uh, this was developed from uh, my particle uh, furniture, and I wanted to make some shapes that would like be cheaper, basically, than doing it with lots of marquetry. And in the end, them in themselves had a really lovely rhythm. So I developed this library system based on the kind of rhythms from one project and it became its own and that happens a lot within my work and that's me in Mexico. Um, and uh, the, the other main, well not main, but the other thing that I've done a lot of recently has been lighting um, because I've been working with glass artisans, uh, one in particular called Piedro who's a really lovely, lovely guy. And um, just as I felt that working with him when we don't speak the same language, he speaks dialect, so I always have to have a translator. If that wasn't hard enough, I decided to work with another artisan eight hours away who spoke another language. Um, so this project is a, is a project that I did with both Piedro and uh, Nouvelle Studio, which is a, a studio in Mexico. So I was sent there to do, um, uh, for an award I won for the W Hotels. And uh, yeah, they, they allowed me to go there and just be inspired. So I went um, colour crazy. <laughs> and I made chant this. Um, so those are kind of, yeah, the, those are the main kind of furniture things that I have done or do. And then this is, at the end, I just have a few snippets of some of the smaller pieces that I've, I've done. So again, this is rings, but for me, it was, it was still very much about pattern and about the construction and how to to rework that to create uh, a new language. So all these rings are made from lots of layers and um, the way they're, they're built creates the pattern within them rather than having a stone on top as the uh, decoration. The, the ring itself becomes a, a, a whole pattern. Um, and then I've done things like bracelets and rings, that's in the wrong order. And then, uh, yeah, lastly, the, this is some pattern design. So th this, going back to uh, probably something which wasn't interesting at the beginning of my talk, but I was talking about Venice and uh, doing different things. This was like one of the things that I did when I was in Venice because I couldn't, I was in a beautiful palazzo, but I wasn't allowed to touch anything. <laughs> like, because everything was like uber listed and uber like, don't touch it. And uh, so when I, did, when I was there, I, I decided to do a pattern based on the floor and I did it digitally because that was something that I could, I could uh, do uh, that worked well with, with the, the building and not got me in loads of trouble. But then I did find their um, printer in the office when they would go home and then I got a little bit obsessed with meat and I did a version of meat. And uh, yeah, that's what I did. 
So t tell us, then, Beth, and as you're looking through this body of work as it's building up and up, what are, what are the consistencies that you find? What, what, what do you find yourself returning to time and time again? Um, well, I think, I mean, obviously I, I'm not scared of putting pattern in my work. I don't always put colour in my work. Like, I've done the previous glass range I did with Piedro was completely uh, see-through because that, that, that was kind of what was very interesting about Pyrex as, as a type of glass. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not afraid to, to put a bit of pattern there if it, if it works. I think uh, maybe consistently there's rhythm, like a rhythm to do with construction or to do with layering. Even I, most of the things that I do, even if they're not a pattern, I see them as three-dimensional patterns. So there'll be like a, a way that the maths within them kind of work out. So I suppose probably things to do with that and um, composition. I do a lot of comp composing different surfaces or different things together to create like an overall theme. I mean, tell, also one of the questions I have for you, which is about really how does your world work? I, in as much as I'm more sort of, I, I tend to sort of lean towards the art world and that I understand, but you're, if we say design world, for instance, as, as one way to put it, I mean, mm. How, how, do, how does it work for you? And could you, in this, talk about Milan and your representative there, mm. and maybe also Basel and design fairs and the like? Yeah. yeah well, there's. I mean, I'm, I've been I've been very lucky in that when I graduated and at that time, there's been yeah this field of design that's art design or that 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 is more open to that design can be one-offs or limited edition and, and um, I work with a gallery in Milan uh, who specialises in, in that so being part of that kind of world has does allow me to do a certain type of work that wouldn't I wouldn't be able to do necessarily um, outside of it. Could you, could you just say a little bit more about the person in Milan and, 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 and it's a lady operating from her own Home, right? is, is no, no, no. She has her gallery. Okay, because I've only seen images of the house, which is all the apartment, which is amazing. But yeah, she. I mean, yeah. she's um, she's an amazing uh, lady called Nina Yasha, and she uh, she first specialised or family specialised in Iranian carpets, and um, she got very well known <coughs> for being able to uh, compose spaces with um, these amazing carpets and furniture. And since uh, the early days, she then became more predominantly known for. Uh, having an amazing eye for putting together contemporary and um, historical and um, beautiful pieces she would find. So that's probably why people always want to photograph her in her home because she has such a great eye for like putting <coughs> stuff together. Um, so yeah, it's, I, I, I met her after I did the Venice residency and I was very uh, fortunate that the RCA that year for the first year had done this thing where they did an exhibition and the people that graduated the year before could put something in the van and exhibit for free. So I was like, how much can I, like how much van can I have? So I took like everything, all the, the hard rock furniture and the particle piece to Milan because I wouldn't have been able to afford to bring them over um, otherwise. And I knew for that type of work, I needed to try and get it seen <coughs> by somebody who could place it in the, in the context that, yeah, it, it could, uh, so, and she's also representing Martino. Yes. Her, so I met her through Martino. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Martino. It's, it's interesting as well. I mean, you're both very, in my view, entrepreneurial people in the most positive sense. And also, I mean, I I met you, Beth, in the uh, in art Basel in in mm. Basel. Yeah. Although there, there there is this wing of it now called design. Yeah, um, Miami, Basel. My, D design Miami Basel yeah. and there's one in ba Basel but let's just say for now Basel and Miami have these huge design fairs and you were manning your own stand at the last one in Basel it's really yeah that's because I won I won this designer of the future award which is um, it's uh, with design because it's it's so it's so long to explain it's like design Miami Basel and when they do it in Miami they're design Miami Miami so I, it was like, so when, you're, when I'm having to talk about the projects, it's Designer of the Future with Design Miami, Basel, and W Hotels, W Hotel Mexico. So it's like, you know, when you're trying to do all the, like, I'm a good person, I'm doing all the right credits, but without any hashtags, because I have no idea what they do. Um, but for, for that award, they, they give you a, a space, a stand, which is like, 
amazing and terrifying. And yeah, um, yeah so I was, I was like. And then, and then you really see right. that the sort of physical proximity between the design, for want of better words, design market, because of course these design fairs are selling secondary design pieces. Uh, I, I, I asked how much a Carlo Molino uh, prototype chair was, and they told us $800,000, not far from your booth. And so you're, you're walking to these environments that value uh, design and present it as though it were contemporary art. And yeah. over the road is Basel Art Fair, yeah. biggest contemporary art fair ever. I mean, what do you make of this connection between uh, art and design? I think I mean in in the right context, it I think it it's good that we're we that design good design is being uh, seen as as important or in some levels as as art just because one is labelled as design doesn't mean there's any less magic. If you know, I I love design, so I see more magic sometimes in. In, in pieces of furniture or you know a coffee cup then I, I do maybe in some paintings because it's a, it's a language of creativity that I, I'm very interested by but also you know like all these things that it can also lead to um, other other work maybe that you that that is very excessive and, and you can have your own opinions about whether that's a good or a bad thing for design but I think to to pigeonhole that design has to only be mass produced is also pigeonholing, um, you know, what we should be. I, I, I'm obsessed, not as much as you in your in the pound shops, but I'm I'm very obsessed with, with when mass production becomes limited, which is why I got obsessed by the la laminates, and we're becoming more and more aware of uh, of of the limitations of of mass production. So I don't. I don't see it as a, as, a, as a bad thing that some designers don't necessarily need to make tens of thousands a piece to qualify its existence. You know, sometimes you can make one, and if it's photographed or blogged, that, that talks enough about, about uh, a conversation um, culturally that, that, that it needs to. So it's, I think it's a very interesting, <coughs> but like all things, there's, there's amazing mass production and bad mass production, and in the same way, there's amazing single limited edition one-off pieces and bad ones. But it's it's up to you to decide yeah. what you what you think is important. And Anna, where do you see yourself? I mean, obviously, you're dealing with the commercial world slightly differently, maybe with more of a focus through photography and yeah. uh, and commercial uh, packaging and so forth. But uh, for instance, where do you see yourself and your practice? Maybe in relation to fashion, maybe or yeah, I think I'm, I've got a bit of that kind of thing, wanting to do lots of different things, maybe a bit greedy. Um, but I've spent my entire time at the Royal College on a fine art MA arguing about why what I was doing was okay. Um, the entire time I just got slated, but you know, that you can't work for a brand and want to do your own thing. and. I don't know, it just was this argument I didn't really believe in there being these different disciplines, especially in a world where it's so bloody hard to even do what we're doing or get it to a point where you, you're allowed to do that as a career. I just thought it was a bit of an old argument and didn't really believe in it. It's extremely interesting for me, at least when I met you initially, it was through the Bright Young Things project at yeah. Selfridges, where we were involved in a panel discussion with uh, the shortlisted uh, finalists, as it were, who appeared in the window. And it, 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 it was a open call submission, but in the final lineup, I, you'll have to forgive me, but two or three of the finalists worked in the store. Yeah. And I found that really fascinating because of course they're graduating from colleges, from creative courses, and at that point going to work in Selfridges, as, as I might at, at one point in my life have gone to work for a gallery or yeah. some such thing. Yeah. And that's how they kept their hand in. And it seems to me that we live in this, at this point where for your generation, perhaps, more than mine, those arguments get even more um, intense yeah. about what it's looks down at its nose at what. Each other, yeah. yeah. And if you think, like, Louis Vuitton has got a massive history of working with fine artists and allowing them to do projects that you might not necessarily be able to afford. You've kind of got to take every opportunity and whoever's going to pay for you to make that work. I couldn't have made that converse thing. I haven't got you know, 15 grand sitting in my bank that I'm going to spend on doing that, that kind of thing. So you do sort of have to take the opportunities. And so the commercial world's helped you access resources yeah, that no, otherwise were impossible. Completely yeah. impossible, and you can't 
can look, whatever level you're at, you can't look down your nose at that. There's no way. Yeah. It reminds me of a period when there was a lot of artists filmmakers who made pop videos to support yeah. what they were making. Do you see some connection there? Is it is it is it freeing you up or is it reining you in to work commercially? Um, I think it depends how you take it. I mean, I think it's it's getting the right balance. You know, I, I also teach as well as I it, I think it's important to teach, but I also of course do it because it gives me some uh, money. And at the end of the day, everybody needs something to be able to put some food on the table or you know explore the next idea. Yeah, yeah. So I think you just have to find the the right balance of what you're comfortable with. You know, um. And for some some work, it's like it gets better sometimes when you get given a brief or you get some restrictions or something to fight against. It's kind of sometimes harder when you've got like you could do anything. It's almost like I don't, I don't know what to do. So um, I think I, I don't I don't see it as being like that new actually that 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 art or uh, art based things are supported by commercial or individuals with lots of money. That's always the way a lot of art was done, you know? Yeah. So, uh, do, yeah. you find, do you find it almost like an old, a sort of old fashioned interaction? Uh, by, but I'm going to pick, on something, pick up on something you were saying, mm -hmm. which is that sense of arguing at college that what you were doing was valid and important in, in their eyes. Is it, were you finding yourself encountering some rather old fashioned views about? I just about thought it was a waste of time. Yeah. That this thing that they had in their head that by working commercially that you were, I don't know, maybe they thought it was, I was looking down the nose at them. I don't know. It was like this weird battle, and I was like, I'm not here to fight this battle. I'm just, yeah. I'm here to do what I'm doing. You can't, don't be mean to me about it, kind of thing. It was just, it didn't make any sense to me. It was like, you're putting unnecessary boundaries on yourself that you're just going to wind up not producing anything because you're scared of what that might mean, which is silly. Yeah. I mean, myself, I've had this greater fluidity between the interests I can have. I, mean, I can be interested in contemporary art and contemporary design all in the mm -hmm. same breath. It's not a problem anymore. Yeah. Somehow, I think this is related to the internet. I don't know why. Yeah, maybe it's I, a... I feel it is. Um, but just, just to go back a bit, also on what we're talking about, KFC Memphis. <laughs> I'm really interested in the fact that maybe some elements in, in both of your, there's some connection in both of your way, in that you're, you're I, I see you both as sort of the queens of the high street, you know, off, off you go to the pound shop or to the nearest market and so on, but at the same time, you're dealing with the, what might be seen as the, 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 the culturally low, let's say. Yeah. You're also very much looking to what we know to be the cultural high, and Memphis now falls into that. Mm. But I mean, it's, it, it, there is some sort of postmodern feel, I feel, sometimes, in terms of what you're doing. And I always thought postmodernism was really dealing in that collision of high and low, mm. historic high and low. Yeah. Well. I mean, is, is, it, is it your intention to take from things around you in that sense and then sort of deliver a, a better, uh, a higher cultural product? Um, I, I, I'm just, I am interested by what surrounds us every day. I've always have been. And so that then of course kind of becomes, it, it filters into, into my work. I think, uh, I mean, for me, like, I don't, well, I chose not to, but I don't live, you know, in greenery or uh, next to a beach or with lots of natural things. We don't live in, a, in, in so much in areas that have all of that around us. What we live in are, uh, what well, I live in or a lot of us live in, in very urban things. And so I think it's just that the work reflects the surroundings. And um, I'm interested in, in kind of working with that rather than working with something that isn't around me that I don't know so well or without having time to go and explore it, if you know what I mean. Yeah. It's funny, cause that Clark's project that I did, it, there's something a bit different about that work and if you go there, it's like the calmest, like tranquil, everyone's getting one thing, it's like a bit of a slower pace, you know, it's in just next to Glastonbury and then all the work came up <laughs> fucking sensitive to my normal like <sighs> kind of attitude to stuff. And it really did rub off, and it probably is just a thing of I took myself out of 
you know, my local normal surroundings mm -hmm. into their surroundings and it just rubbed off that quickly. I desperately want to do a show just of your collection of pound shop items <laughs> at some point, by the way. Also, I just wanted to ask, there's two young creative people making their way in the world. We've spoken a little about this previously, but what is it, how would you describe London as a place to be uh, a young artist working today, Anna? It's, it's all I've ever known, so I don't, it's hard for me to say what it would be like not being here. Um, I think it's really hard when I get assistance coming through that of, you know, rent and stuff, having to move to London is like the impossible, I don't know how people are doing it, obviously my mum and dad are still in Deptford, so I had somewhere to go to after university to come back and be, although I wasn't there for very long. You just got to wheel a deal and find your the cheapest option of everything. Um, it's, it is hard, it's, it's increasingly hard, maybe even more so than when I moved back from Brighton. It was like this, you know, seven years ago. It's an, another jump now that everything just seems to find that cheap corner in is even harder. I don't know how people do it. I guess you just make it work, don't you? You've got all works, <coughs> all sorts of jobs when I first started. So I had a normal job, you know, in a pub, and then I worked at Topshop doing display, yeah, and then see. did while I was doing MA, ran a business with another girl. I was doing like four things at once. Yeah. You learn not to sleep. Yeah. I I um, that's... Uh, I I mean I yeah I came to London a bit as like the 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 mecca. Of, uh, of where I wanted to go or where I felt I should be going to be able to yeah get into the industry I think of course you, there's loads of different ways to get into industry or to create and I can only speak from the way that I felt but for me I, n I really wanted to move to London to the pace to be in the same area that if I worked hard enough I could meet other people or you know you go and find other creatives because every a lot of people come to london um to be creative and i think i was really drawn to come here for the mix but obviously you know it's not it's it's not super easy and, and i think um i did the same when i i moved to london in my year between my ba and my ma i worked a bar and i worked uh for a glass maker in exchange for getting some of his studio and uh, you know you find ways to be able to make work and you tailor your work to your environment that you have um and say yes to everything in yeah. case you yeah. meet somebody that's the next opening to the next thing i think that was the most important thing and you know, I, just, I, I just want to have one of those area conversations but um bethany you've just moved to a new studio in waltham so yes and that's, I think next stop is Belgium, isn't it? What, how, how, how? I know. I, the, my friend Oscar, who found the, the, the warehouse, he didn't even tell me we'd, we'd left Clapton until I'd like agreed to the space. And then he was like, you know, we just crossed the, the canal. And I, and I was like, yeah. yes. And he's like, you're not in Clapton anymore. And I was like, <laughs> so it's, it's, I'm only on the edge. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, a lot of people are moving that way, I think now. Um, because it's just too, it's just space is a premium and uh, it's, it's we, not easy to get. We just had a talk on Wednesday night called Trouble with Rent, which was all about this and the idea of how difficult it might be for artists to be in London at the moment. I just uh, did a small, quick talk at um, Kingston University uh, two days ago as well, where they asked uh, how, how I went to art school, I went to painting and studied a uh, painting course and then in Camberwell and left and found the first three years very, very difficult indeed. And I was asked, how did you survive in that period? And I completely forgot that one of the things I did was um, go on drug trials uh, connected to London Hospital, where for a week I tested junior aspirin. So my answer to the question, how would you make do and get by this period was not so much to take drugs, uh, it was just become a human guinea pig. Yeah. I think that was the, I, the only way I did it. But, uh, but it, I mean, there must have been moments of, of, of real struggle as you're just leaving college, and it must have been impossible. Yeah, definitely. My dad's always got a story that when, where he grew up in Warrington in North England, he, there was a new school opening down the road and he decided he wanted to go there because he knew there were better facilities. But he was signed up to the old, the other school. So every day for like three weeks he turned up and sat in the class and they're like, you don't go to this school. He's like, yeah, I do. And he was 11. Yeah. And I think that was like the way I've been brought up. If you want it, you've got to go and get it. And it doesn't matter who says no, you've got, you know, you've got to fight for it. So that's it. <laughs> 
measure anything in that category, but we won't ask. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, and, and uh, just before we maybe take some questions, which would be great, just to ask you really what you're up to now. Bethan, you're, you're probably embargoed to not say anything for the future uh, Milan <laughs> uh, uh, design fair, which is coming up. But what, what's keeping you busy right now? Yeah, I'm just I'm, wor I'm working, uh, doing a show at Nilfa, um so we're going to discuss the the pieces, and um, I'm doing a piece uh, for Quabat, uh, which is a uh, fabric company, uh, which I'm excited about. And um, I'm doing a residency in February with in Vincenza with artisans again. Um, so the outcome of that will be shown in Milan. And uh, so yeah, just a few things. Um, yeah, I've got. Because it's always such a short leave for me, so I've got a long leave project with American Apparel that's coming up, um, working with Kenzo, and then I've got some editorial shoots coming up, so I'm busy. That's <laughs> amazing. It's incredible to hear how busy you both are. You know, you've not had a free weekend in months and months and months, I'm just saying. But if anyone would like to ask a, a, a question at this point, it would be nice. Um, I know it's always that pause, that lull. <laughs> If anyone has any, uh, any, any, any more thoughts, I mean, just uh, maybe one last one for, for, for me. But given as this is sort of a, a talk series called Culture Now, as in you know, this very day, this very minute. I mean, how 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 do you see um, your your world, your place in it at the moment? I mean, in terms of your work and and, and how you're going out there, is it? Are you going to have to really forge and shape everything? I talk about my own generation. I was reminded, sorry to say, but we invented galleries and dealers in order to kind of get. There was a network that wasn't. It, the network wasn't there, you know. Mm. But in order for you to sort of progress and, and, and make your way forward, make your, uh, yourselves known in this world, I mean, what, do you, what do you make of it at the moment? Uh. <laughs> No, I think it comes down to your kind of your peers and who you admire and knowing people and them knowing you and knowing that you're up for stuff, you know. There's that thing of like mm. some of my oldest friends, they're just getting their foot on the ladder and calling me up, being like, let's do a shoot and they're just getting signed by the big agencies and stuff. And those connections are probably the most valuable thing ever because you know, they they're long term, yeah. they know what you're about, you know what they're about, you know that it's gonna be an end product. That for me is probably the most important thing um, you know, about making things happen in any other way. No, I think I think that like I, I don't think it's particularly new, but I definitely think you know with the way that I'm not a Twitter, I'm not very good at that kind of stuff. But the way that we can like spread a communication now, I think it's it's uh, kind of amazing. But I think it's always just important that when you meet people, that you you take make the most of opportunities that you've got, and you don't like take a piss or look down on something because you never know you know who's going to come up or who's going to go down or and you you're going to go up and down a lot you know especially at the start when you're you know trying and testing things so I think it's just important to kind of you know be positive and open to things that come across and and like meeting new designers and other people and not be like oh, no they oh, oh, don't want them to see what I'm doing but like yeah. be open with other exactly. creatives because Together, you can really make you know interesting things happen. But being secretive and hiding everything, then that can you know Shut that doesn't really off. yeah it yeah. doesn't yeah. really move anything forward. It's funny how important that ability to net to connect and stay yeah. connected is still so vital. I mean, you you guys now have the digital technology. I know we're not perhaps that's not sort of hashtag fanatics as it were. But, but, <laughs> but what is it? What, I, I, do you use it? Do you, do you use social media? Do you see this, this sort of digital engagement? Not in as way as well, you probably should. Yeah. Going because if you're going back and do like tutorials at universities and stuff, you're surprised at how nothing's got a physical outcome. Everything is digital. You know, it's a presentation, it's a film, it's all done from a laptop or on like a big screen. And it, like, what about when you know we used to sheets of paper and it might just be a, a weird thing that you've made. There's like that physical aspect's really disappeared when you're going when I'm going back to universities. Um, and a lot of my assistants that come through and they're in a whole next world of platforms that are not. <laughs>
Cool. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> but yeah, it's not really. Yeah, I think we're probably like that, like that bracket that we were aware we of it, but we really didn't grow with it, and like don't. I don't. Yeah, I don't really feel the need. I have an Instagram, but I, I'm really bad at knowing what I'm meant to hashtag or like I can't spell for toffee. So then I get. I'm like I'm meant to just put up images. I can do that bit. But then I have to suddenly be able to spell the right hashtag or something, and then it just feels quite forced. It's just too much. There's another yeah. thing to add on the list yeah. of things to do. I, don't, I think it can be an amazing tool if it's right for you to use it, but I don't, at this point in time, I don't feel the need to like enforce it upon myself. But I'm sure that will probably have to change at some point. But um, yeah, I'm kind I of do, more I worried like about making stuff. Thing, I like the interactive element that you can bring a crowd together in that way. And there's something in that that I'm really into. But as I said, a lot of the brands are absolutely terrified of that, the actual connotations of using that because in case somebody says something bad about the event. So they, you know, but they asked it to be interactive and then retracted it at the last minute and it couldn't be interactive. So there's kind of, I wonder how actually it will wind up stunting things rather than letting and, them and, get bigger. And in your, your uh, teaching work, um, Beth, do you see a change in the students? <coughs> I, I was rather almost nearly upset recently when I heard students at, um, at the new King's Cross um, art school can't leave their work up on the walls overnight. They have to fold it away. And I just thought, how, do they? Yeah, I was like, so how, nice how does that happen? But do you see changes in this? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I teach quite a lot on the on MAs, and um, yeah, I think there is a different. There's a lot more digital. Or there's a lot. Uh, there's a lot of s surface scattering. You know, it's it's very easy now, or you can catch out sometimes if a student's being a little lazy. If you Google in the same word that they've googled, if they've just picked the first ten images. You know, they've not really researched very hard. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it can, it's amazing because in some tutorials, like I'm like, oh, there's an artist that I can't, as I said, I can't spell for toffee. So I'll describe something to do with their piece of work and the power of Google will find it for me and I can show the students. So in one way, it's a great way to kind of quickly access something to then be researched. But I think sometimes there's, uh, there can be, it's very easy to not really go very deep. In, in that research and go to the library or just kind of have a look at something physical. So I think sometimes there's like, um, there can be both amazingness that you can get from the power of Google and also a bit worrying um, because Google doesn't know, well it wants to know everything, but it, it, it's, it's not always super deep. Mm -hmm. And I think for students, it, you know, it's amazing like, the time that you can get to really develop and work on a project and in the real world you, you probably are having to develop about six things at the same time with very little time to do it so I think it's really important that, like when when I'm teaching all with students to really kind of try and push them to research deeper because you have the time to do it which which is it's really a luxury time uh, outside of uh, education and the time to sort of make mistakes and yeah. actual like physical <laughs> mistakes rather than when it's somebody else's time and money it's yeah. hard we have a question yeah it's to do with your practice really it's like obviously you're both fascinated um like with materials and that's what drives your practice but what qualities is it within the materials that makes you choose them so what is it that makes you pick a certain object or design to me there's always just a language that runs through it and it's always been the same as it's a certain type of texture or something that just is off key and doesn't go together yeah. and if it if there's something that I know I can put it with something else then that that conversation is going to happen with the two things so yeah they'll fall into certain categories but they're weird categories yeah. <laughs> and I can't I don't even know if I could really name them like there's like a, a colour palette that me and my friend nicknamed Tina, and that's like a certain <laughs> colour palette. I can't, yeah, I can't really describe it, but there's certain things that fall into the Tina category, so there's kind of weird stuff like that that's just sort of picked up as time's gone on, and that makes sense to me, it might not to anyone else. Um, yeah, like plastic. Yeah, I mean, I, I've got a penchant for, for plastics, and some of the things that you use I, I, I like very much, and but I think I'm also, 
Yeah, it, it depends. Some sometimes like the laminates material I got obsessed with, and I like that it's slightly plasticky and it and it, it it's kind of also it's representation. Yeah, it's fake and this. So those kind of things I'm interested in. But then things like the Pyrex that came about mainly because. Um, uh, we, I visited many uh, artisans, and, and Piedra was one of the artisans that was possible to work with. And uh, obviously, I, I've, of the materials, that was very interesting to work with. Do you like um, the act aspect of like changing function? So it seems like most of the things you produce, like it's not essentially what they're there made for. Yeah, I like things that wind up with no function at all. <laughs> things that chase their own tail. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I think I, I I'm I like yeah, I think with, with the laminate the, the aim of the project was to kind of change the connotations of the of of, of how we see that material. And then with the Pyrex kinda of, I don't know how much it was there at the beginning, but I, I like if you look at it within the story, again that it's another material that's from the kitchen, um, and being kind of used in a much more kind of crazy way than it's it's normally used quite tamely or mm. for very kind of functional things. Um, so yeah, I, I, I like that about those materials, but I don't necessarily feel the need that I have to say that I will only ever work with low grade materials. Yeah. I think I think it's harder sometimes to work with luxury materials because they're you know that they're inherently more precious. They cost a lot more to kind of mess about yeah. with. Um, I think sometimes it's easier to work with uh, materials that aren't necessarily loved so much because you're free. People are going, here, you can have it. Yes, yeah, it's not worth anything. Yes, right. Um, I think it's refreshingly uh, honest and candid of you to say that you don't require or need labels. I think that's great because I think that then sort of um, enables you to sort of go in the direction you want to. And I think labels quite often. Um, are there to validate institutions rather than the creative practitioner. So I think that, I found that part of the conversation very interesting. Uh, my question really was around um, where you source your ideas um, and your interest in the sort of uh, de democratic nature of uh, design, particularly for pound shops, you know, the fact you find value in the colour and the, and the ideas. Mm. Um, and I saw a video of you both in the market <laughs> The joy you had looking at this vintage jewellery, and you know, it's just the colour and glistening, glowing about it. You're very excited about it. Yeah. So, what you both find really interesting, I think, is the democratic nature of design and objects. Mm -hmm. how, how do you balance that kind of inherent interest in accessible design with work that you? Produced now, which is aligned to luxury, high-end design. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, I don't know if I even don't give it much thought. No, I mean, that's fine. It's just I wonder if you had a pressure. No, the more I can get away with, the better. I think that's what it comes down to. I, I like to, yeah, that idea of putting something that just they just shouldn't let me do it, and then I really get off on that. That's and yeah. I mean, I think for me, I mean, I didn't when uh, like the the laminate works the easiest one to talk about in con context of so that, and I think I didn't a I didn't design it with an aim that it it was about being able to be sold as a luxury product. Yeah. The aim was about um, designing something that that changed the connotation of the material, and so in that sense, it was correct for it to be sold at a higher price because that that was all part of the the concept. Yeah. Um, so there I don't really have a, I don't, uh, it's kind of, it's part of it that it ends up at that point. But I also think it's what's accessible, you know, like I, maybe if I had bags and bags and bags of money, you might find me at a, a flea market of um, much more expensive goods. Um, but I'm not, I mean, I, I, I love uh, flea markets mainly because they, they're this kind of, boiling pot of mixtures of time periods of styles of things that were in and that were out and you can find a whole range of things so yes of course there's quite a large majority that's of a particular price level otherwise it would be you know maybe being sold somewhere somewhere else but I think that's why I really enjoy buying from those kind of things and and for me I, 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 I find pound shops really interesting because like we immediately go in knowing that these things are cheap they're a pound 
Um, but, you know, like, I haven't put it in this presentation, but I start a lot one of my presentations with this guitar slash fishing game sweet container. Um, yeah, and, and I love it and, and hate it and I'm scared by it at the same time because a lot of the things in, in, in a pound shop are incredibly tall. They have a huge amount of input to be that cheap. Mm. And I, I find that very fascinating. And um, and I think, you know, there's a mix of how some of these things get to pound shops and sometimes it's 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 to do with that age that they were produced at some point and tooling's been passed on or it's been, you know, so it can be then made that cheap. But mm. I think I, I find those kind of fascinating that um, the volume allows it to be so cheap, but but the, its construction, the materials it's made with, everything to do with it, its design is not necessarily cheap. Mm. So I think that's kind of what how the two worlds start to kind of interact. I've always got a thing of with flea markets and pound shop. There's like this idea of Andy Warhol's million dollar find kind of thing that you, especially with a pound shop, I like it because once it's in and then once it's gone, you can't get it anymore. It is like mass production, but once it's gone, it's gone, and I'm, to I'm totally not mm. that it is a limited edition. Mm. So I'll go in and I'll buy, they think I'm so weird. I'll go and buy ev all of what they've got. <laughs> and think, what are you gonna do with it? And I don't even know, but I know that once it's gone, I won't be able to get more. So I think it's a, <coughs> both of us probably like, it's a, more of a celebration of materials rather than any kind of, oh, that tacky, you know, love it kind of thing. It's like, yeah. mm that's tacky and it's brilliant and I want to show it to other people because they might not have noticed it. That's kind of mm. where I come, come from with it. And if it looks good with a Chanel shoe, then I'll offer it. <laughs> <laughs> yes? I remember, um, well, my boots many years ago, came out as a wood grain. Mm. Yeah. And you used to stick it on wood. And then we used to say that's a pretty dishonest because yeah. what you're doing, making plastic of that wood and you're covering up the wood and that's it. And then it's sort of that probably came out, which was horrible, plastic things, you should be stood up as well. And I'm wondering whether you seem that your love for materials, uh, is there an honesty in, in the way you look at materials? Do you say that is a, a really nice, a shiny plastic? <laughs> and it's an honesty because it's, it looks like plastic? Or do you yeah. worry whether, I mean, bits of meat that look like plastic, um, you're changing the sort of honesty of the material? Or there is, do you feel that there's an innate um, honesty in some materials, which I don't have honesty. <laughs> um, I've got the whole Selfridges background that I used was this wood carpet that's meant to look, it's a carpet that's meant to look like a laminate floor. Mm. And I just really like the idea that you'd have either a wood floor or a laminate floor, mm. and then you put a wood <coughs> on top of it. And there's something brilliant about that. Um, to stop it from getting damaged. I, don't, I just think it's the best thing ever. And it is deceiving, but in like in quite a happy way. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I think that like um, uh, n natural materials or um, real materials to fake materials. I I think it's 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 an interesting thing because like laminate as a material is naturally is pretending to be so that's yeah. naturally what it was part of what it was born from so it's not really unnatural or fake for it to do it because it's it's the nature of the material mm. but um i think you know we're we're more and more aware uh that everything is subjective and everything is is kind of fake yeah. that that we're, you know we're, we're continually happy to kind of live with different levels of of knowing how much is kind of real and how much is fake and you know everything from you know, your, your carpets to your nails to your if i'm going eyelashes. to make a fake it's got to be like a a proper fake but like not a kind of like a stone that's been reconstituted to look like stone but you don't know it's stone it'd be like a plastic stone i don't know there's something in that definitely that i want it to almost be obviously not what it is like a good few steps removed when i'm looking for stuff that's always something that I'm looking for. Um, I think we should wrap it up now in terms of the, this bit. Um, but I would it'd be great if you two, um, Anna and Beth, are here. Uh, so if you want to have a few quick words with them uh, privately, uh, please do. <laughs> Not dodgy at all. Not dodgy at all. <laughs> but just to say, uh, I really think you're you're great. I think you're, I think. 
you're successful now, and I really wish you every success going forward. It's incredibly exciting to hear young voices. Uh, the last weekend of Bloomberg New Contemporaries as, uh, as we speak, and it's just great to hear you talk about these things. So I'd like to, if we could do a thank you both. Thank you very, very much.